Good evening and um, warm welcome to the LSE Taxation Seminar. My name is Eduardo Baistrocchi. I am an Associate Professor of Law in the Law Department. It is indeed a great pleasure to introduce a very distinguished guest today, Diane Ring. Diane Ring is a, a Professor of Law at Boston College uh, Law School. And it is very hard to underestimate the global influence of her tax scholarship in the G20 and beyond. Her research is fundamentally focused on international taxation, corporate income taxation, and ethical issues emerging from the practice of, of law. And today, Diane will be presenting her seminal paper, Leak Driven Law, in about 30 minutes. And then, uh, also a very distinguished intercontinental and interdisciplinary panel of discussants will offer their views. I'm referring to Ian Roxanne, who is director of the LSE tax program, Martin Herson, who is a, a fellow at the LSE International Relations, and Partho Shom, who is a former professor of economics at the American University, advisor to the Indian finance minister, and LSE visiting fellow. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Diane. Already I've had a chance to talk quite a bit of tax this afternoon, so I'm looking forward to the rest this evening. But as promised, 30 minutes, no more, no less. Um, so to get us started, um, uh, you know, when we're talking about um, leaks here, um, what really got my co-author, Shu Yi Wei, and myself interested is over sort of the past 10 years, um, really seeing sort of the active role uh, that leaks have played in developing tax policy uh, both the design and the enforcement, and really sort of the role of seven major leaks in that process. Um, and so just to quickly say what we're talking about when we say a leak, um, we're talking about uh, taxpayer data or related information, um, usually connected to offshore holdings, or at least in one case, sort of the, how that was going to be taxed, agreements with governments on taxation. And the information is coming from uh, various kinds of third party financial or other advisors who had this information. Um, sometimes it's shared with the government, but the key for our purpose that makes it a leak is it gets to the public. Either the actual data itself, or at a minimum knowledge that this kind of data exists in the quantity and scale and some of the details. Right? So that's what we're talking about when we say leaks. Uh, one of the questions I thought I'd address up front is sort of why now? Why does it seem to be a big deal now, or is it? And, and we would say actually it is. Um, but we also have sort of some thoughts as to why that might be. Um, and it's really a function of sort of two forces coming together, in our view, um, that since 2008 has led leaks to really sort of take on this new kind of role um, that we're seeing, at least in taxation. Um, and the first has to do with the difference in how data is managed and handled. Um, now that you have uh, more centralized and more com computerized data, uh, it becomes easier to obtain data, sort of gather it, to transfer it, and then disseminate it to the public. Right? And that's really what leaks are going to be about. Um, and then the second is the increase in the significance of cross-border transactions and cross-border business. Right? You've always had cross-border business, and you can go back, you know, decades, centuries, millennia, uh, to find cross-border commercial activity. Um, but since the 1980s, what we've seen is um, a liberalization of currency controls, right, of foreign direct investment restrictions, of trade restrictions, at the same time also sort of a, a, a revolution in technology that's allowed communication uh, across the globe uh, to move much more smoothly. And so um, there's a lot of indications that's really contributed to the volume, the rise of cross-border business. And so if you have something that's pretty important, dollar-wise, um, in terms of the economy, and now you've got information on it that's coming uh, and moving around quickly, we sort of think that's really where the power of leaks um, in the tax area has come from. So major, uh, major effects that we'll be talking a little bit about um, is, as I said, both in the enforcement of existing tax law and the design of new tax rules, and both of them we're interested in as we look at this. Uh, but one of the things that 
got us interested in the questions here are that everyone seemed to be focused on what to do with the information, but it was just pre presumed to be good. It's useful. Of course it's great to have this leaked information. Uh, now let's figure out what exactly we want to do with it. Um, and we thought that you really need to ask that question a little bit more carefully. Is it always good? What is it doing? What is the power of sort of this, uh, this kind of information? So our paper argued that uh, the view we had been seeing that leaks are just good, let's now move forward, um, was in some sense a bit simplified. Um, and that, in fact, leaks do create costs and risks, and the government should be taking them into account and should actually know what they look like. It's not just sort of a generic take it into account. You actually have to know what you're looking for. What do you mean when you say they're risks? And so that's really what drove us and really what our paper is trying to address. So uh, for today's talk, I'm going to focus on uh, three leaks in particular. We talk about seven right now in the paper. We're adding an eight because, of course, Paradise Papers has since emerged, so we need to incorporate that. Um, so we're going to look at three leaks just to sort of get a sense of what these stories look like um, and then talk a bit about uh, how they played out and where you want to sort of, what does that say uh, in terms of the kinds of risks more generally and what we might be recommending uh, to governments. And we don't think that the effects that we're talking about are limited to the U.S. We've seen some of them actually obviously in other countries already um, and some of you may have better perspectives on that, um, uh, you know, from outside the U.S. All right, so to get us started, uh, so those are the leaks right, that the paper talks about. Um, and as I said, I'm just going to go through three because they sort of hit upon some different points and ways in which leaks vary. So the first one uh, that I'm going to talk about is UBS. It's actually at the top. This is 2008. Right? Uh, and just to give a quick overview, uh, Birkenfeld, right, the, the person in question, the leaker, right, he's a former UBS uh, banker, and he blows the whistle on uh, UBS and what does that mean? He delivers some client names and account type information and tales like from the USI, tales of diamonds and toothpaste tubes. Right? That was the sort of thing that caught the American eye. Uh, but really it was about bank, bank actions <coughs> uh, intentionally, strategically <coughs> trying to help US taxpayers avoid US tax by hiding income and assets outside the US, particularly in Switzerland. Right? So that was the core of it. Um, and he goes and he talks to the IRS, our tax authority, to our Department of Justice, to the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, and ultimately also our Senate, uh, which was investigating uh, later, over time, some of these kinds of concerns. For his troubles, right? 40 months in jail, right? not for the leaking part uh, or the sharing of information, because uh, his is actually going to the government. His information is going to the government. It's the knowledge of what he had to say that then becomes public and is really the leak side of it. Uh, 40 months in jail, but he also gets $104 million as a whistleblower. So I leave it to you whether, you know, that was a package you'd be up for. Uh, but that was what he got. Uh, UBS, they get a deferred prosecution agreement with the U.S. They pay $780 million, <coughs> including taxes and penalties. Um, they turn over some names. Then there's also a continuing sort of dispute with the government, <coughs> the U.S. government. Uh, who sought additional names, there were subsequent negotiations. Then from there, the U.S. does uh, prosecutions, both of taxpayers who were engaged in the hiding, uh, as well as some of the bankers uh, whom they could get their hands on, who they felt were actually engaged in what was uh, criminal action in terms of tax um, evasion here. Also, uh, they instituted a voluntary disclosure program, right? Taxpayers who have now seen the great publicity know the IRS is coming after them, can come forward right now and confess all their sins, pay large sums of money, and avoid jail. Right? That's, that's what you're getting right, for coming forward, voluntarily disclosing, yes, I have been bad, I had all these offshore accounts I was hiding, I will tell you, and I will pay, and I will stay out of jail. Okay? Um, also, the IRS set up a Swiss bank program, I have to call that the Swiss bank program, uh, and it was sort of a tiered analysis of uh, conduct uh, and risk among the various Swiss banks. Um, and as part of that, which I'll mention a little bit later, uh, they get additional information and participation from the banks in return for certain protections from the US government. Uh, but part of this is an information cascade. And that's, one of, that's ex very explicitly what the, the US was interested in through all of this, which is as you get one piece of information, you use it to find out more people from whom you can get more information. And, and again, it just keeps going. Uh, I would say it's, it's actually not an understatement. It's a fair question to ask, but it's not an understatement to say uh, that leaks were an immediate impetus uh, 
for the FATCA legislation in the U.S. And I'm not sure how much you all are familiar with FATCA, uh, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, but essentially, it's legislation that comes in in 2010 that has sort of two prongs. One is uh, effectively forcing, not, you can't literally force foreign financial institutions to do something in the U.S., but kind of, right? Uh, foreign financial institutions are required to provide various kinds of data and information on uh, U.S. taxpayers and their accounts. And it also imposed certain restrictions and burdens on U.S. taxpayers in terms of their reporting uh, requirements and reporting expectations. All right, so I'm going to come back to that later, but that's sort of the basic uh, setup here. The second one I want to talk about is Panama Papers, right here towards the bottom. Right, so shift gears a bit. Uh, this is not an employee. This is an actual leak where the substantive underlying data does become public. Uh, but it's not, or at least to our knowledge, not an employee who's releasing it. It appears to be perhaps a hack, but it's an anonymous data source. That's what we can say. Uh, and this is 2014. This anonymous source gives this data, uh, uh, which I'll describe in a moment, to Bastian Obermeier. He's at the, and I will not say it properly, but Süddeutsche Zeitung, right? uh, German newspaper. And the German newspaper that now has this data, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, needs help working through too much data to work with. So they go to the ICIJ, the International Consortium, International Journalists, right? Um, and they work together um, to try to analyze, prepare, and ultimately be ready uh, to disseminate the data. And they announced the leak in April of 2016, and then a few weeks later in May, release the data that they intend to release. And this project involves about 370 journalists. So it's an enormous project with a lot of participation, uh, and 76 countries. So they're working on the data um, and getting it ready to be put out. So what is the data? Right. Uh, 11.5 million records, that's a lot. It covers 40 years, from 1977 to 2015. That comes out of the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca. Okay. Uh, and the core of it was approximately two, uh, 214,000 offshore entities that were identified. Right? Uh, and that's relevant in the sense that, you know, well, who's behind those entities? Who owns those entities? It's individuals connected in to about 200 countries, so people everywhere. Uh, and it's always interesting when it's people of prominence who have these accounts, especially when they haven't disclosed them domestically. And so uh, caught up in this with um, uh, accounts being identified, offshore entities, I should say, being identified, uh, the president of China, the president of the Ukraine, uh, the Pakistani prime minister, who actually then, uh, he and his family faced corruption trials, and he's ultimately disqualified this summer uh, from public office for 10 years. It goes <coughs> on, right, the list um, of those who were identified, and in some cases had some immediate repercussions. Um, more broadly, the, the sort of responses to Panama Papers were varied across countries. Um, many of them initiated investigations. In that sense. So Australia, France, the Netherlands, UK, um, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, Singapore, etc. cetera. Uh, in the European Parliament, a committee uh, was investigating whether there was violations of US law and looking for solutions there. Uh, Panama, for its part, uh, had reactions on multiple fronts. It kind of went back and forth a little bit over time, both sort of participatory, this is bad, we're going to sort of try to get to the bottom of it. Um, they agree to commit to the OECD um, CRS, Common Reporting Standard. They're going to sign on to the Multilateral Convention uh, for Mutual Administrative Assistance, so sort of getting involved that way. Um, they also set up a commission to look at transparency um, and sort of financial and legal issues inside the country, although that seems to have had some problems as it went along. Uh, but bottom line, Panama Papers is bringing uh, a strong focus on beneficial ownership. Right? Do we know enough about who owns what? And is that information being shared the way it should be shared? Okay. Um, the final leak I want to mention is LuxLeaks. Uh, and so here we have a French citizen, Deltour, uh, who's a PwC employee. So we're back to another employee. Uh, and he copies a set of tax rulings uh, from PwC uh, that they have on behalf of their clients. Right? So they went to uh, Luxembourg and got tax rulings that sort of guarantee their transactions uh, in Luxembourg would get certain treatment. And that allowed them to ensure their tax planning worked smoothly. Just sort of say that. Uh, some might say it uh, was facilitating tax evasion. That's sort of where it ultimately kind of went. Uh, but these rulings were the subject that was being, of, of what's being released here. 
Um, so he does this upon quitting, right? He takes it as he's leaving. He shares it uh, with a French journalist. Uh, and then later it gets shared with the ICIJ, uh, which ultimately publishes about 500 of the rulings. Okay? And this is in November of 2014. Right? And so the sort of the public takeaway from this release is, wow, look at the role of the Luxembourg tax, it was really one person, tax side, uh, in essentially rubber stamping uh, whatever treatment the taxpayers wanted so that they could sort of run <coughs> transactions through the Luxembourg um, uh, system and get the really the tax savings they wanted in other countries. Right? So that was the concern here. What comes out of it? Well, first of all, there's now lots more attention to tax rulings, both in Luxembourg but also in other countries. Uh, and in October of 2015, the EU agrees to certain terms now uh, regarding ex automatic exchange of cross-border rulings that's sort of within the EU. Uh, the EC launches a uh, consultation on sort of corporate transparency generally, so it's not just this issue. Uh, but we also have parallel developments in the European Parliament with their special committees. We've got various recommendations that are all coming out after that. Right? Also creates, and I'm sure you've all seen this, like a little discomfort, I imagine, at least I see that from the press, uh, for the EC President Juncker. He was right, Luxembourg's financial minister as the rulings were being done. He wasn't doing the rulings, but sort of at that time. Uh, as for our leaker, right, uh, Del Tor is charged, right, um, as was the journalist, uh, but there's also a push for increased whistleblower protections kind of running through Europe at this time. So you've got, in some places, the whistleblowers are being, you know, prosecuted, uh, or the leakers, whatever word you think is, we can get into that. Uh, but there's also a push for more protection, uh, and the European uh, Parliament gave him the European Citizen Award um, in 2015, right, so obviously different perspectives on, on what's going on here. Okay. Um, and just even from these three, you can get a sense the leaks are different in different ways, whether the, the kind of data, who's uh, sending it out, um, the scale of it. Um, and so it's not surprising, it's sort of, you're gonna see slightly different effects as we go through. So as I said at the outset, the stated assumption that we've really certainly seen in the US has been that this is just all good, it's just presumed to be good. It only can be helpful to governments, it's free information as she heard the phrase, a free audit, right? And, and who could be against that, right? Well, except taxpayers, but, but if you're on the government <laughs> side, right, a free audit, this is fantastic. Uh, and uh, it just can only be good for tax law and tax policy. And in a sense, from a rational framework, that's right, right? Um, if you thought that sort of information was just being used in a rational way, you might say, well, okay, free audit, what does that do? It increases the probability of detection to 100%. That's a, uh, kind of useful, and it's less costly way to get additional information. Okay. Um, it's gonna help you, I mean, all you're gonna do with this catch tax cheats, right? How could, again, that be bad? Uh, it also might make taxpayers a little more cautious about evasion if they see this now out there as a risk, right? Even the ones who, for whom their data hasn't been leaked, their transactions or their third party advisors haven't yet been caught. Uh, this is a risk now they know that's out there. Um, it also might give us some distributional benefits. The p people, for the most part, who are uh, being caught through these leaks, identified, <coughs> uh, are your higher end people. Right? You have to have, sort of have more assets, typically, not 100% though, uh, to have all sorts of you know, uh, foreign chains of entities through which you hold things, right? an array of foreign accounts. It's not, it's not typically our poorest taxpayers. Okay? Uh, and all of this might be especially helpful to governments in the area of international tax. Because as it is, your other ways for getting information are gonna be, whether it's through sort of a treaty exchange or even some types of withholding, all of which can kind of be uh, imperfect uh, and sometimes slow. And capital can move quickly, right? So bottom line, by decreasing the costs of detection, uh, it does seem like it's gonna enable our tax authorities to more easily catch that marginal tax evader and therefore raise revenue at relatively little cost and therefore uh, add social benefit. Okay, so, but as I said at the outset, our paper um, suggests this is a little too simplified. Um, leaks are not always socially beneficial. We need to think a little bit more uh, about the risks right? and maybe uh, think about ways in which we could prepare or plan for them. And so what I'm gonna do is just briefly identify the two sort of major ways we think about risks and then look at two scenarios in which that sort of happens in the context of the leaks. And so the first concern uh, we identify is that of agenda capture. Right? Uh, that through the leaks, 
uh, the public agenda on tax enforcement and tax policy sort of is captured uh, and potentially shifted by those who construct right, and frame the leaks. Uh, it's their agenda, their priorities, and, and their roles in shaping data that really give leaks their power. And I'm going to talk more about that. Um, the second concern we have uh, is what I might call the downsides of salience here. So salience being the idea that this kind of information is very public. Everybody knows it. Right? You don't even have to be a tax lover and you actually know about the diamonds in the toothpaste tube. Uh, and so it has a much wider audience, uh, and therefore everyone's watching what happens and wants to hear, well, what did you do? Right? And that can, that can have a huge upside, and there's some really interesting threads in the stories about ways in which this salience really prompted governments that had actually knowingly uh, let strategic or powerful individuals in knowingly let them invade tax, right? and that that had to stop once it became public. Uh, so there are ways in which salience really works to the benefit of uh, tax enforcement. Uh, but what we're interested on this other side are the ways in which it can trigger responses that are ill-advised or perhaps uh, inadequately uh, examined to be sort of designed properly. Uh, and that when you're sort of forced to act fast and seem really proactive and aggressive, uh, you may not actually come up with the sort of best regimes that you can, and you can't always fix them, certainly not in the U.S. And we see this kind of concern and observation about the risks of regulating in the context of a crisis. Um, also examined, in, we see that in the financial literature and in corporate governance. So it's not something that's limited to um, the US. One thing I thought I would uh, mention right now, because it comes up a lot, is, well, aren't a lot of things you're sort of talking about true with any information the government gets? Right? Certainly in the US, the IRS loves to get tips. Right? Are you a disgruntled um, have you just been fired, right? Would you really like to get back at somebody, right? Come tell us something. I mean, they don't have posters that say that, but I mean, there's a sense <laughs> in which that would be a bit much. But there's a, I mean, there's certainly a long tradition of people uh, sort of sharing tax information when they've gotten really irritated. Uh, and don't they have agendas? Absolutely, right? Isn't it targeted? Absolutely. Uh, so why is this any different? The government seems to manage just fine working with that kind of data. Why would you be concerned about these leaks? And so this really gets to the point about leaks being public, being highly salient, it, which means it's in the public space and the public momentum has a force uh, in shaping government policy that doesn't allow the regulators to sort of take their time or sit back and think about it. As I said, sometimes that can be good, but there are ways in which it's gonna be problematic um, as well. All right, so with that as sort of the two basic themes, I now wanna do, uh, very briefly, two examples. Actually, I see because of so. I'm so excited talking, I forgot to show. <laughs> so this was sort of just the picture of some of the benefits, the free audit, etc. Uh, those are why it's good. And then I've just now been talking a bit about why it's a concern, right? Agenda setting and salience. Right over here. Um, one thing I also didn't mention is uh, um, transmission. It, it is not as if leaks just immediately work. Everybody gets it. It's all simple. It's straightforward. It's really interesting to see how leak data works its way through the system and how that can create its own challenges. I'm not going to have time uh, to talk about it. I'm going to focus on the first case study and the third. So the role of the ICIJ in Panama Papers to give us a sense a little bit more about what is uh, an intermediary, sort of <coughs> what's their role in this process of leaking. Um, and then a little bit more on the enforcement side and the development of regimes that perhaps are not all they could be, that's FATCA uh, and U.S. enforcement. Right. So uh, as to agenda setting, the role of the ICIJ sort of here in Panama Papers, um, as I mentioned, right, the, the ICIJ uh, is the one that's going to get the data, organize it, and put it out. And, and in fact, they play that role in quite a number of the leaks that we had up on uh, the screen. So HSBC, Panama Papers, um, Lux leaks, British Havens leaks, Bahamas, Paradise Papers. So they're a major go-to. If you want to leak right now, you're probably thinking, right, the ICIJ. Okay. That's a nonprofit. Um, what do they do? Right? Uh, so they get data, but they're now going to be reviewing it, creating searchable databases. They're formatting. Uh, they're not providing original documents. Uh, they're not providing all documents or all data. So there's a selection process involved on their part. Uh, which is, in, in some sense, inevitable. Uh, they control the timing of what's released and how it's released, whether staged or not. Uh, 
And they also can time it in the sense that they have done their commentary and their analysis so that as soon as they've released it, they're in a position, both themselves and their affiliated newspapers, and they're explicit, there's nothing you know, that's not obvious, uh, but to immediately run the news article, they're sort of analyzing this data that's just been put out. So not only is the data released, but the framing of the data is sort of ready to go all at once. Okay? Uh, this isn't a criticism. This is just a fact. I mean, that's, everybody's got a different role. They're an agency. They have a, a news agency of, and, and, or a body, uh, and they have their own vision. They talk about what their interests are. Uh, and one of the things that we talk a little bit about in the paper is that it doesn't necessarily match exactly what a, a tax authority is trying to do. It's not that it isn't, there aren't good goals, but it's not necessarily the role of a tax administration. Um, and so it may suggest that sometimes what they're trying to accomplish through the leaks isn't really what the IRS, for example, should be doing through tax enforcement. Uh, but more broadly, um, this identification of sort of the power of uh, someone like the ICIJ and sort of the shaping and framing and dissemination of leaks, it doesn't tell us whether leaks are good or bad. It just tells us that they have a role, that leaks are not uh, neutral, they're not random, they don't just drop down, they're structured and planned. Uh, and the same we can also say for the leakers themselves, they're deciding what to take, what to share, and as I said, that's true with people who give tips, but now the scale, scope, power, publicity uh, looks uh, significantly different. Okay. So that's really looking at the sort of agenda setting question. Um, the other problem I wanted to talk a little bit about here comes out of FATCA uh, and the U.S. response to offshore, uh, offshore enforcement. And so when I, when I introduced uh, the UBS story, um, I said that not only do we prosecute uh, the taxpayers and some of the advisors uh, and sanctioned UBS, but we made these sweeping changes, the bank program, FATCA, the Voluntary Disclosure Program. We also had another set of rules, um, the FBAR rules, about requiring certain kinds of account reporting. That had been there a long time, never heavily enforced. We found it, we got all excited, really went after the enforcement. Okay, so that's, that's what we did. Why is that a problem? Why is that kind of concern? If you've got people who are hiding their money offshore and not paying their taxes, that sounds pretty bad. And if you can capture them and or stop them from doing it in the future, that sounds really good. And so I wanted to say a little bit about why FATCA is problematic and sort of what that suggests about reacting quickly in the face of uh, sort of the, the glare of publicity, a sort of failure to realize the scale and scope of uh, the offshore evasion. All right, so a couple of problems that I would focus on. First, who gets ensnared by FATCA? Uh, and I think one argument is to some degree it's the wrong taxpayers. Um, there's a, a sort of a view that we can't document, I mean, that is, we can't prove, uh, that perhaps the people at the true top completely escape. I mean, the really, really well advised, right, were actually able to be moving their accounts and their assets before this really uh, hits. Uh, and that is separately a question about some of the other leaks in terms of uh, time lags of a year or more. And the processing also means certain parties have more inability or opportunity if they're very well advised and positioned. And, I, and when I say advised, I don't mean good, solid lawyers. I mean people in the know. You have the, your ear to the ground, you know what's happening. Uh, but the wrong taxpayers. And so this is some of what you probably um, heard about from your own sort of media, right? Everybody who's a U.S. taxpayer is subject to the FATCA reporting requirements on their own part and huge penalties when they fail. And that's part of the problem. It'd be one thing if the wrong people got ensnared and had trouble complying, if the penalties were small. But the penalties are huge. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, but who gets ensnared? Expats, so U.S. citizens. Uh, and living abroad. Okay. Uh, why? Because they actually have to have foreign accounts of all sorts of types. It's hard to sort of live abroad with no foreign account. Uh, and so they need to engage in the compliance required. Immigrants to the U.S. If you're a business person, or even not a business person, you come to just now work in a job in the U.S., uh, you don't necessarily sever your entire <laughs> life behind you. You may maintain accounts, family, et cetera. Might be on your mother's account at home to help manage for her. Right, so you've got a continuing financial connections that you now have to uh, report. Um, and then another problem is new immigrants to the U.S. Right? People who were paying no attention to U.S. tax for the past 30 years of their life. Rightfully so, they're not in the U.S. They come to the U.S. and the first year they're here, they're trying to figure out all the things they need to comply with. This turns out to be one of them, and maybe they don't get quite right. But it's hardly because they've been ignoring the message from 
DOJ, Department of Justice, for the past five years, which is actually what sort of DOJ thinks. If you're still doing this, you must be bad, because we've been telling you for five years we're serious about finding you. So if you're not fully reporting, it must be intentional. But obviously not. You've got this group. Okay. But why is it so hard for them? Compliance is actually difficult. It is very hard to find lawyers in the U.S. who know this law. I've tried to actually work with people facing this problem, and you can easily be someone who has these reporting obligations, but you don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend on tax lawyers. If you have hundreds of thousands, I can actually find you a lawyer. But if you don't have hundreds of thousands to spend this year and next year, it's a little harder to find someone who actually knows these rules. And that's kind of scary because the penalties are high. Uh, and second, uh, it's not even clear the scope of the rules. Uh, the way, you know, we think foreign accounts in Europe, what you have in mind is the target the service has in mind, your treasury, right? The bank account hidden abroad. But the language is designed to be broader so they capture future planning evasion. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, except real people who have real lives in other countries still have all sorts of things that look like they have account components in them and could be captured by the rules, but no one even thinks of those as foreign financial accounts, the kinds that uh, we're really interested in, but your failure to report may actually be a problem. And then we're back into the world of penalties. Okay. All right. Uh, and then one last thing on sort of FATCA here is on the enforcement side. We have uh, uh, an independent office inside our IRS, our, our enforcement agency, uh, that really looks at taxpayer, looks at the entire system from the taxpayer's perspective. It's called the Taxpayer Advocate. Uh, and they did a study on uh, the voluntary disclosure program and found that the penalties paid by the smaller <coughs> taxpayers, smaller accounts, often not advised by a lawyer, were disproportionately higher than the penalties paid by the parties who had much bigger accounts and were also well advised, right? which is really not what, what the, the results should look like. So even going through the uh, voluntary disclosure is problematic. All right, um, so where do we end up? Uh, we've got various risks and benefits. Um, we sort of offer three sort of basic recommendations, no magic, but three recommendations, just as governments really try to start to think a little bit more about this. First is we urge them to be uh, sophisticated consumers of data, right? to actually think about who is the source, right? um, to anticipate potential falsity. So one response I got sometimes from some people who had been in government, well, all the information's been true. Why are you, they thought we were nuts. Why are you complaining? Right? It's all true. Everything we found, we've heard so far is true. And I would still say you have issues about shaping the agenda, et cetera. But I also said, okay, it's been true till now, but what, when it, what happens when it's not? Maybe parts of the data is not true. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, if you really want to mess with somebody, think political, et cetera, you slip in false data into a pool of otherwise real data. And eventually maybe it'll sort itself out, but maybe not. And after we've had some of this, the Macron problem emerged right prior to the election. Right? That wasn't exactly an actual leak of data, but it was the sort of announced it was going to potentially happen. And, and after that, we actually started to get people a little bit more interested. I mean, I'm not suggesting this is what I want to see happen, but it, to me, it's just sort of a risk. Um, and you want to be ready to anticipate that not everything you get is true. Uh, and if, you're, if you love the ICIJ, it may not always be the ICIJ who's doing it. Right? You need to think about uh, what, the, what the world might look like. And this is part of what we talk about future. So be sophisticated consumers. Uh, have a conscious plan to keep your responses rational. <coughs> right. So part of what I, uh, we sort of think uh, led to some of the problems with FATCA is what, th what the perspective was for lawmakers as they were designing it. Right. Their, their focus is very bad people knowingly, evilly, intentionally, and with great glee, hiding their money offshore. Uh, so they kind of didn't focus on everybody else covered by the rules. Right? And if you sort of n know that these are sort of the, the forces that can drive you as you're responding in uh, a leak context to public pressure, uh, you might sort of have a little bit more of a process, maybe a little bit more of a break to sort of uh, engage uh, in a more careful review of the legislation you're drafting. And then finally, sort of a commitment to your first enforcement principles. That is, what do you think good tax enforcement looks like and why? And is there anything about the leaks that's changing that? Right? And if it is, okay, that's good. If you've learned something that's changed your vision of what good enforcement looks like, that's okay, but it should be conscious. Right? It shouldn't just be the, the wind shifted and so we're just going to do it so that we look good 
We don't look corrupt. We don't look lazy. We don't look ill-informed. Uh, we have three open questions. Last three things, right? Uh, what's going to happen with future leaks? Will the shifts and changes we're seeing now, whether it's, say, uh, beneficial ownership registries or things like FACA, will they become entrenched and that's what will stay? So the new leaks won't have an effect, or will there be continual upheaval as you have uh, new information? Second, where's the battle between transparency and privacy going? I don't know. It's not limited to tax, but I think it's going to be really important. Um, and third, uh, what about the market for leaked data? Will it be a competitive market? Right. Uh, for example, we saw some members of the EU Parliament establishing a, a EU leaks um, site. Okay. We have competitive sources for data. Uh, or will we see more monopolies as the way in which sort of uh, intermediaries work? And so bottom line, we sort of are encouraging and questioning sort of where the future shifts will be. I look forward to all the questions and comments. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much, um, Ian and Eduardo, for inviting me to give some comments. Um, I um, even as I was uh, reading uh, this um, fascinating paper, um, as um, Diane Ring pointed out, um, the appearance of Paradise Papers kind of muddied the very good taxonomy that the authors have uh, achieved. But uh, it just goes to show that we will get more and more of this. In fact, the apparently in the Paradise Papers, from what I could find, um, in addition to the Panama Papers, 13.4 million documents uh, uh, leaked by hackers in Wikipedia uh, from Appleby, an offshore law firm, ended up in a German newspaper, sort of um, uh, mimicking <laughs> the Panama Papers experience. Mm. And the information included investments and funding structures of 120,000 businesses and individuals, including monarchs, political leaders, and highly valued companies. The headlines of International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ, um, which is a collaboration of 380 journalists, propelled countries such as Spain and India to immediately initiate official investigations. Nevertheless, could it be that most of the leaked accounts are of legitimate businesses? And this is exactly the eventuality that uh, Professor Ring and a co-author caution against. Thus, from this last uh, slide, I would say the thing that struck me most, and I will go through some of the taxonomy because I found that to be very unique. Um, the, thing, the two things that struck me most was a challenge of optimization between the benefits and the risks. Um, so as I was reading, I was thinking, well, where do the authors come out? And you know, is it good or bad? I have a final comment on uh, good or bad, but it's an, an issue of optimization. And the second one is one of distribution, why it might have some salience uh, to it. So I will uh, first list a little bit of the risks, because that is what I found, uh, or the imperfections um, in this uh, uh, leaked data uh, business. One is the income. Some of it she has mentioned in a broader context of particular uh, leaked sources that incompleteness, second, non-specificity, third, false positives. Fourth, whether the mode of transmission is government or newspapers will cause disparity in their effects and their dynamics. In other words, these are very voluble uh, imperfections. The risks include, so I'm, all the negatives I'm uh, ordering. Fifth, agenda capture by actors outside government. When to leak, what and how much information, what information not to leak, implying that the tax authorities themselves get filtered information. Sixth, since leaks are high profile shocks with high impact, they carry distinct hazards of trigger happy government and public, reacting more strongly than they do to systematic data. 
And seventh, this leads to ill-advised legal and enforcement responses. Scholars in securities regulation, financial regulation, and corporate governance have observed that laws as impact of crises comprise overreaction generally. So my immediate reaction was, well, uh, these are to be expected from the very nature of leaks um, in terms of shock, value, and so on. And they already anticipated my expectation of worries because they said, in fact, I'll, I'll come to that. As the authors themselves say, leakers are often anonymous and hackers a heterogeneous pot puree of sources. Also, if systematic data were good, that is my question, then why is their productivity so dismally slow? Is there a built-in let sleeping dogs lie approach to tax administrations, unless they are prodded to wake up by exogenous shocks such as leaks or other sources like heavy-handed uh, politician who may be quirky and push for certain um, changes. These are the risks and the imperfections. Now the benefits. Among benefits the authors include one, leaks providing the tax administration with a free audit as she explained and new information. Second, a clearer picture of cross-border activities. Third, a higher probability of detecting other evaders, as well as for a higher cost calculation of evasion by potential evaders. In addition, fifth, though less systematic than statistics, leaks data could lead to more and faster legal change. And sixth, leaks could have positive distribution effects since they should uh, reduce abuse by sophisticated taxpayers. And of this, I will give an example before I end through undeclared offshore assets and complex corporate uh, offshore structures. Here, however, I must say that I'm sure this process and with the follow-up of different banks and tax authorities, we are generating a whole group globally of uh, complex persons for tax purposes with very little assets worldwide. And uh, just because uh, they are immigrants, they work um, uh, in various countries, they have uh, um, uh, uh, assets everywhere and so on, and some assets everywhere, uh, they are fragmented, but it uh, has given a huge cost. And here itself, I might say that uh, they pointed out in the paper, something that uh, you didn't mention for time, I'm sure, that FATCA costs to institutions and taxpayers an estimated $8.76 billion over a 10-year period. However, that is what FATCA would raise. However, the costs of compliance with FATCA approximates $18 billion per year. And I was very confused about that. And uh, so you can see that the proportion is so disproportionate. And, but I could believe it because FATCA is not just in the US, by the way. Even emerging economies, uh, tax authorities, and uh, lawmakers have come down with FATCA. So everyone in India is calling up, do you have a uh, the authorities and banks and all over. So even middle class persons who, have, who had nothing to do with bank accounts five years ago but have recently started bank accounts are all under FATCA. So, uh, and of course the thresholds are much lower over there. So you have these kinds of um, things going on. The leak drivers, as she says, are uh, I, to illustrate some things that she said, that the role of ICIJ, whose funders are Ford Foundation, Pew, others, and their stories are carried by the BBC, Mon uh, uh, Le Monde, New York Times, and several others. Uh, ICIJ's Panama Papers claim real owners of opaque structures. But if you really go into it, I mean, the, the, this Panama law firm, uh, Mossack Fonseca, if you really go into it, however, the authors point out that the papers don't disclose any bank accounts, emails, financial transactions, etc., that would actually give some insight into the background of these accounts and who owns what. I mean, for the public, no one can really uh, access it. So who does? We don't know that either. So this incompleteness is the author's crucial point that the ICIJ released a fraction of the information. It decided what to release, possibly what, whatever was shocking. Uh, also, the time delay between data release and obtaining the data raises questions regarding the possible strategic timing for the release of data. Thus, this power and control by media carry risks, though it does not 
comprise pure criticism as say the authors and I again was a bit confused because it was leading to pure criticism but then they come back and say <laughs> but they come back and say but if you use it in a good with good judgment you could probably use it so um, uh, I would compliment in fact by uh, this by saying that what about other banks I mean we got information on HSBC everyone was calling in India saying do you have an account in HSBC my god <laughs> etc etc but the uh, how many banks have come in this three four and um, so one kind of begins to wonder about this incompleteness not just of a particular set of data but the global data sources and then leave alone data mining how much of it is actually mined? I mean, you were talking about, you, you took that data mining takes place, but in advanced countries, and of course in emerging countries, only a fraction of data that is available, that is made available, is actually mined. I won't go through the um, uh, uh, suggestions to the government by authors, but to me, I was a bit amused when you said, anticipating publicity, government's responses should not be rational, not slop, should be rational, not sloppy. And I, I like that phrase because I thought that was a bit of a tall order having worked in government <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of trying to finesse uh, terminology and terms uh, from within government. However, I think I will now uh, shift focus a little bit and what is my view in all of this? What I can say is that I learned so much from it that sometimes I feel when you try to understand something, first confuse yourself and then try to resolve it. And that is what happened. I was quite confused and when I saw the taxonomy, which is brilliant, um, I saw how clearly something very complex um, and impossible to separate out uh, was done in this paper. But my view is that given the growing concentration of wealth globally, and given the revealed tax administration inability to track stashed incomes and obtain tax revenue from them, is it is not possible to expect the exclusive use of systematic data. Of course, and of course it has become so much easier for non-systematic data to appear and be available, however partially and however much in a biased way. Of course, it remains uncertain, and this is very important, if country tax administrations actually follow up until the true end of the process or terminate with the completion of political vendetta, especially if they are not fully independent, are themselves corrupt, or are willing putty in the hands of ruling politicians. I'm familiar with instances of this behavior in quite a few instances, and it is not difficult to recognize. <clears throat> but before I end, I would like to put the findings of the paper in some global perspectives as to why leak-driven information may make the denizens of emerging economies happy. I give India as an example, which has signed on to the UN's Human Development Goals. There was a 30-year period, but 13 years remain for not with the objectives for not only reducing inequality, but also leaving no one behind, eradicating extreme poverty, ending hunger and making all of them sustainable. Indeed, a listing of comparisons for 2015, which was the last year, the 2016 data have just appeared, is an eye-opener from the Human Development Index that comes out from the UN, where India is still ranked 131 out of 188 countries ranked. During 2010 to 15, India's improvement in this HDI rank lagged behind Brazil and China. Brazil's poor income distribution was well known and now India has surpassed even Brazil because in the Western world Brazil is always pointed out but <laughs> India's income distribution is now worsened. This is revealed through a coefficient of human inequality derived using Atkinson's inequality index which is 5.4 for Norway, 7.8 for UK, 12.9 for US, 25 for Brazil, and 26.5 for India. Third, once this coefficient of human inequality is incorporated into the Human Development Index to obtain an inequality-adjusted Human Development Index, India's percentage loss in the Human Development Index is 27.2%, which is the greatest. In other words, when you incorporate the inequality factor, 
and even higher than Brazil's loss in this correction. <coughs> the UN Human Development Index also reveals the extent and intensity of poverty. It uses a multi-dimensional poverty concept. It is a, a definition, I won't go into it. But what it shows is that this multi-dimensional poverty is, raises India's poverty level to 55%. And domestically, all domestic experts spat over whether it is 26 or 27 or 28, 29, 30. But internationally today, we are told it is 55. So one thing is clear that the inequality of wealth and income is rapidly increasing in a country like India. The inequality index is the highest today in wealth in the whole world, uh, in India. So in these kinds of countries, when you see something like um, um, unplanned, shocking data, the hope is always that maybe it can be used, provided, of course, they are used, provided they are mined, provided they are not misused, uh, over which one doesn't have. So radical innovation, including streamlined population policy, rapid expansion in taxpayer registration, rather than spending public resources on pursuing the same existing registrants which is done, steeply progressive income taxation for newly created top brackets, rather than the top brackets always seeking tax incentives and getting away with tax incentives, reintroduction of wealth tax which was abolished a few years ago on real and financial wealth for over six million pounds say, massive redistribution of income, wealth and land if required through constitutional amendments and stipulated private sector commitment to corporate social responsibility. These are the kinds of things that countries like this in India need and additional leaked information may help in this process of redistribution of resources for the right uh, goals. Hopefully, of course, not at the cost of too much suffering among good taxpayers like myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane, for a, a, a wonderful presentation and for a, a wonderful paper behind it. And, and thank you also, Partho, for those very illuminating and contextual remarks. Um, I, fa I found the paper really interesting, and I found the, the conclusions also really valuable. I don't really have anything uh, to say against what's been uh, any criticisms of, of any of the arguments that Diane raises, uh, Pato, who's already, Pato and Diane have both explained to us uh, what the, the risks are that have been identified and, and it's really valuable to have those, those made explicit. And I don't really have any, anything, any problem with any of the, the recommendations that are, that are made either. This is, you know, this is all, once it's, it's one of those things, once it's explained, it's perfectly logical. And you, you wonder why we didn't think of this before. Indeed, I, I have to say, I always had these doubts about it, but, but no, it's really nice to have it ex expressed in, in, in detail. And uh, having had a few run-ins with, with some of the process by which FATCA ha has operated, I've, I've seen how that works and the challenges for, for other governments in, in dealing with it. Uh, one of the interesting features of it, which, which Diane didn't mention, is that the way it's been implemented internationally is that in, in principle, it places an obligation on all these foreign taxpayers to provide information to the IRS in the US. But what's in fact been done is that agreements have been entered into between the IRS and other tax administrations so that if you're a foreign taxpayer in the UK, for example, you provide the information to the UK tax authority, to HMRC. And HMRC has an agreement with the IRS to transmit the information. And um, the IRS is willing to enter into two types of agreements, unilateral ones and reciprocal ones. Uh, so reciprocal ones are wonderful, except that the US doesn't have any authority to provide information in return, so they are reciprocal in name only. Uh, and that's an, an actually quite an important feature of FATCA, which I will <coughs> come back to. So I, 
I really have only two points I want to make, which are not criticisms of uh, the problems that the authors identify or criticisms of, of the recommendations, but of the analysis that goes in between. In providing the context, uh, Diane says, you know, we look to globalization. Globalization and uh, the advancements in technology have provided the means that have made these leaks possible. And, uh, but that involves a discussion of the growth of cross-border businesses. And, uh, and as the paper points out, there's really only one of the leaks, Lux leaks, that has to do with business. And it strikes me that, that there is another significant factor which uh, brings almost all of the leaks together, and that's the financial crisis. Now, even if you look at the HSBC one, uh, where the data was being collected in 2006, that was the time of the, the, the financial frenzy which was going on in the, the financial sector, which led to the, the financial crisis. So I think there is actually an important story to tell that you know, the, the processes that were driving the financial crisis, the way in which the banks were behaving immediately before it and, and, and the effects of that, and particularly the, the political shocks which also resulted in, in the, the BEPS project and the, the dynamic response of, of the G20 to, to tax issues with this sudden political involvement in, in technical tax matters uh, worldwide is, is a, an important aspect of, of, of the story and an important explanation of why the leaks arise. But that also says that the leaks are not happening in a vacuum. The leaks are not happening simply because there are a bunch of journalists with an agenda or there are a bunch of annoyed uh, employees leaving these organizations or some clever hackers who have decided tax is our thing. That is, there's actually a, a broader social context in which it's happening. And that brings me to my other point. And that is about understanding what the problems are. And, and the one difficulty I have with this, if, if Partho in particular will excuse me, is that the analysis is very economic. And, and having uh, an economics background as well as a law background, I, I feel I have the, the liberty to complain about <laughs> So we're given this, this model of how the... Um, of how one does tax administration, which is about this optimization and about uh, balancing the, the marginal cost of enforcement with the marginal social benefit. And that suggests that, that tax administration is this wonderful rational process which is being disrupted by these, these leaks that are coming in. And essentially, we have a, a model of economic rationality, and suddenly we have this, this eruption of shocking and salient material which is disrupting the process by, by which it operates. But Partha sort of highlighted the, the problem with that. He, he said, well, we have this concern. If this data is so good, why are governments so slow to re react? Why is it that they seem to only react if they're prodded? And that's because they are also operating in a political environment. Uh, there's a reference in, in, the, in the paper to uh, the response to these leaks affecting the tax administration's ability to optimize the enforcement of existing tax law. But if the model of tax administration is welfare maximizing tax administration, there is an assumption embedded in that that existing tax laws are welfare maximizing. And of course, existing tax laws are the result of a political process with all sorts of vested interests involved. So when the paper speaks about questioning agenda capture by the leakers and, and what vested interests may be represented by the leakers, that's not something which is foreign to the process entering into it. It's another uh, way in which other interests are coming into the process, which I, I think, again, ties in with, with the sort of concerns that, that Partho is, is raising about inequality and so forth, which are the sort of concerns which the financial crisis has raised and, and has you know, made tax political again. Uh, 
So instead of MAGA, we have MATPA. Make tax political again. Uh, <laughs> MATPA. Um, and that's what's happened. Uh, but tax is always political. Tax does not simply exist in an economic discourse of rational maximization of revenue with an ideal welfare maximizing distributional result. There is also a political discourse within which tax operates. And the administration is sitting somewhere in between. So really, if we want to have a really valuable analysis of how it is that the tax administration should inoculate themselves against bad reactions, or, or tax legislators should inoculate themselves against, it, against bad reactions, we need some way of fitting the economic rationality into this political discourse. Because the political discourse is fundamental to the way the tax system develops and the way in which the tax system operates. One way in which we can do this is, I would suggest, to, to look at the legal discourse about tax as, in, in a sense, mediating between uh, a dispassionate, rational, economic discourse about tax and the political discourse of tax. So this idea of uh, trying to um, keep responses rational and, and keeping to, to good enforcement, those are, in a sense, a, a sort of pause which the legal system can do and say, well, we, we have procedures to follow. But saying we have procedures to follow means we, can't, we have to stop and think. It's a way of saying, uh, a way of forcing everyone else to say, to, to stop and think and say, we can't just react politically. We need to think about this. We need to go through procedures. And those procedures, their real function is to allow us to come to a considered conclusion. But I think, I think the only one of the, the three recommendations that I have a problem with is the idea that we should keep to good enforcement. Because that implies, again, that you know, without these uh, suddenly salient uh, sources of, of data from leaks coming along, we're engaging in good enforcement now. I mean, certainly, it's a good idea to make sure that our responses are tempered so that the result is good enforcement. But in responding to the leaks, we shouldn't necessarily, necessarily assume that we started with good enforcement and we need to avoid being, being sh shunted off the good track we were on. And I think some of the examples <coughs> that Parker has given us have shown that there are all sorts of problems that can exist with, with our enforcement. And indeed, you know, our, the concern that Diane rightly uh, raises that uh, the people bringing this leaked data may not have always entirely good motives, as the, the Macron case highlights, has to be balanced with the fact that the people running the tax system don't always have good motives. You know, the worst case, as Partho says, is that of corruption. <coughs> But I thought the, 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 his comment about you know, whether tax administrators follow the information through to the, the logical end or stop at, at an earlier point because of the political realities really describes how this political discourse is operating in, in driving the tax system as well as the economic discourse. And, and uh, a thorough analysis of the effects of, of the leaks really needs to take into account that the political discourse is already there in the tax system. It's not something that the leaks are, are bringing in from outside. Now, the question is, you know, is that going to in improve the situation? And that brings us to, to what is, in fact, perhaps the, the real hinge point, the, the transparency versus privacy argument. Of course, in, when you look at that, it's interesting that there are, in fact, tax systems, like the system in, in Sweden, which have very high levels of transparency historically. So you know, the idea that, that privacy, you know, that we think of in, in, in the UK or, or the US, that privacy is something fundamental to the tax system, 
it is not quite as self-evident as it seems for in, inside our, our systems. But as the paper points out, there are cases where people are using offshore structures, where people are dependent upon privacy for non-tax reasons. There are perfectly legitimate reasons why, why people are, are using these structures because of, in extreme cases, fear of persecution and, and various other uh, <coughs> external reasons. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's a substitution of, of tax avoidance or, or tax evasion for some other sort of regulatory avoidance or, or evasion, which can be equally bad, but there are equally some, some good examples. And there are also the examples which arise particularly in, in FATCA of people who are using structures which, which only look obscure when viewed from one country. And it, so the, the story of FATCA is, is, is quite interesting in, in, in this respect because, in a sense, it, it may be that its, it's apparently overbearing nature is not so much the response of, of haste, but the response of opportunity. So the US is this, this large country which is able to enforce FATCA essentially through withholding taxes. And so it's a combination of the withholding taxes plus this citizenship basis of, of imposing income tax, which has enabled it to have this, this enormous spread. <coughs> And that has resulted in the, the very high costs to the system, which Partho has pointed out. But on the other side, uh, he also pointed out that the way it's been adopted by other countries, so you know, a large number of countries through this common reporting standard of the, the G20 and the OECD are involved in creating FATCA-like structures. The one country that isn't contributing to it is, of course, the US, which won't provide any information, even though it's insisting on getting information. But I wonder whether, when you generalize that, has the common reporting standard been set up on a basis that it actually, by making it common, reduces the compliance cost, by making it something routine? So it, it, it may be that the problem that you have with, with, with FATCA is not so much that it's a hasty response, but that it's a, a response that was able to use power structures that were, were inappropriate, but also that it, it took that because of a political reality. <laughs> a political reality in, in, in the US which reflected the congressional process and meant that there wasn't an opportunity to take other choices. And that's related to the fact that you have these agreements with, with other governments which are at a governmental level and are not reciprocal because they haven't been recognized by the US Congress because of the, because of the, the, the deadlock which has existed for so long in, in the US Congress and which seems to manage to continue despite uh, the Republican dominance. So you know, once again, the result suggests that the problems with FATCA may not be so much ones of haste but ones of politics. And I, I think you know, if, if we can extend the analysis to being more than, than simply this nice rational an analysis, we then can see a, a, a really the possibility of a, a, a really extensive explanation that, that brings this, uh, the whole analysis and all this valuable information and the valuable uh, recommendations to, to something even more useful than the, the, than the wonderful article that we already have. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Diane and I were talking about past dependence just before the session started, and one example of past dependence is when the uh, commenters before you make the same points you were going to make far more eloquently than you were ever going to make them. <laughs> um, but we also, we finish at eight, right? So I am going to be very quick because I'm more interested in hearing what Diane has to say in response than I do in, in hearing my own words. Um, so let me just make four points quite briefly um, in response to this paper, which I thought was very, very interesting. And uh, I've been sort of tangentially involved in some of the leaks in, a, in the capacity working with 
particularly the Paradise Papers, but it also um, in the past. And so it's been very interesting for me to think uh, the, the paper both in terms of its normative contribution and also its conceptual contribution, as Partha, may, Partha pointed out, I think very, very interesting. Um, the main points I was going to make were around this notion of rationality and the political nature in which this political debate in which this these leak interventions have, have, have taken place, and so I won't add to what uh, Ian has already said on that. So my four points. Um, firstly, I think I think it's particularly interesting to observe the way in which the OECD itself has responded to the leaks. So the, the leaks are a transnational phenomenon, particularly the ICIJ leaks. They don't take place really within the bounds of the nation state. And although tax administration itself and tax policy making does, the OECD plays a, a, a role in that tr same transnational space. So I think it's quite interesting to note the way that the OECD responded. I um, spoke with a, a friend who works in the OECD Centre for Tax Policy and Administration uh, during the week of the Paradise Papers leaks, and he said, we haven't seen Pascal all week. He's just been touring, touring the, the TV studios, trying to emphasise the fact that the OECD has got this covered. So I think one of the things that the leaks has done consistently as well as its influence on uh, domestic politics and domestic uh, administration, is it's, it's also provided a bit of an existential threat to the OECD itself, which feels under pressure after the failure of the Harmful Tax Practices Project um, and the, the fudge that is the BEP project, um, to demonstrate that it is useful, that it is solving these problems. And so I think some of the, re the, the response which I, I, I feel is, uh, could be more present in this paper is some discussion of that transnational <coughs> space in which the, the leaks have also influenced policy. Um, my second point is um, uh, is to comment on this this aspect of I think um, horizontal equity that, that that you raise in terms of the selectivity of some of the uh, leaks. Um, I think this is interesting because um, it is certainly the case that prior to the leaks, certain taxpayers were at greater risk of having their tax affairs entered into the public domain through the actions of media organisations. Um, and I, uh, in my past capacity as a tax campaigner, I was involved in some of that. Um, so I know that you were more vulnerable to being the target of media campaigns, which then led in, uh, often to legislative change, if you were part of a court case, for example, when your name would be made public. Um, and one of the big examples of that, which many people cite as being transformative in the UK, was Jimmy Carr, the comedian, whose tax affairs um, were very widely uh, commented on after he was part of the K2 scheme, which was um, information of which came into the public domain. And so I think that's a good example of where um, uh, there were that we didn't begin from a baseline of horizontal equity in terms of the likelihood that your information would become the subject of public comments uh, in the past. Um, similarly, if you're a company and you're a household name, you're much more likely to find yourself the target of media exposes than if you're a company nobody has heard of. Um, if you're a company that's publicly listed, information that journalists can use to try and uh, study your tax affairs is much more likely to be in the public domain than if you're a company which is private. Um, and if you're a company that's structured in such a way that your subsidiaries are publicly listed, the same point applies. So I think um, what the leaks do is they introduce a, uh, an additional concern about horizontal equity, but not one that was not already present um, in the public debate that has been existing around tax since <coughs> 2008. Thirdly, uh, the point you, made around, you, you make at the end around um, the extent to which this is likely to lead to entrenchment or more radical change. And I think my own observation looking at the debate around the Paradise Papers is that um, is that the reaction has been, well, we already, we already know this. I mean, we didn't know it was Nike, but we already knew about it. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think we probably have reached peak leaks now. And so I think maybe it, it is interesting. I actually worry that perhaps we reach a point at which people feel, well, everybody is doing this to the extent that we're powerless to change it. Um, the ordinary person perhaps thinks, it's not just a select few, and I want my government to deal with that. It's so entrenched that actually it's always going to be there. So I wonder if the leaks are actually starting to almost become counterproductive in the narrative or in the extent to which they are holding the, the government and the administration's feet to the fire. And finally, um, the discussion 
I found two things interesting. One was the um, the the HSB story, HSBC story in the paper. And one of the things it shows is that um, when the French government was committed to supplying information to other countries, such as India, um, they sent inf a certain amount of information. When the information was publicly disclosed, the Indian administration found considerably more information than they'd received from the Indian government. I think that's an interesting example in the context of the uh, uh, current situation with country-by-country country reporting at the OECD, where developing countries' access to that information relies on receiving it from the headquarters countries of the multinational companies. And I think what it potentially speaks to, in terms of the other thing I found interesting, which is the discussion around monopolies versus competition in the future supply of leaks, is that maybe, maybe the correct response is for governments to nationalise the leak process by making much more information publicly available to begin with, and thus creating a situation of more horizontal equity. And that will be in terms of public rather than private country by country reporting, and public rather than private registers of beneficial ownership. Now, there is a debate around whether that's a good thing, but given that leaks are with us, that perhaps should inform the debate around whether or not it's a good thing. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Now we have 10 minutes for to open the debate to, to the floor. I'd like to know if there is any question or comment you would like to make. comments but by <laughs> limit to, um, to three. Um, with the exception of I think the one reference by Diane and a brief reference by Ian in passing um, to privacy, there's been no discussion at all about privacy, confidentiality or data protection. Every one of these leaks involved a breach of rights to privacy, confidential relationships and data protection there. And I think under risks one should be looking at what this says about the lack of concern for those sort of protections there. Somehow, because the information may have disclosed tax avoidance, tax evasion by certain people, those rights are somehow, it can, we can be forget about those. And the possible impact in terms of how willing people may be in the future to give information to tax authorities or to their advisors I, I, is a, a risk. Um, second comment, um, and I may call a witness to um, support me on this. Um, I was teaching um, on the day that the um, um, uh, that that that, that um, the original um, Panama Papers were um, leaked, and there were information in the Tundi Times. And one thing that struck me was that the initial reporting focused on the corruption element; that this was evidence of corruption at high level. And I said to my students, and one of them sitting behind me, so she'll either say, my memory is wrong, but I said, I bet you within two weeks, the focus would have shifted from the evidence of corruption at high level to a focus on tax avoidance and evasion. Forgive me for saying so, Diane, we are all tax lawyers, or tax <laughs> practitioners here, actually, so it's not surprising, but we are part of that process. And I think the same thing's possibly happening with Paradise Papers. The BBC programme that Martin appeared in, for example, disclosed potentially an allegedly very serious level of corruption in Angola. Um, but I bet you that the focus will be on the tax avoidance element um, of it there. I, I, I'd be tempted to think that governments like the idea, and this may be seizing the agenda uh, back, like the idea of using this to prove that there is evasion and avoidance, and therefore they need more and more powers and more disclosure information. But on the other hand, they don't really like the element of challenging corruption, because actually they rather like to accept corruption. We all know that some of the other governments do it um, there, or we do it ourselves in the case of some governments um, there, and they don't really like that being um, disclosed. Um, third and final um, uh, comment is this, um, and it goes to CRS um, there. I was very puzzled when the OECD was working on CRS, and for that matter also the EU on um, the, um, uh, the Director for the Ministry of Cooperation and the Automatic Exchange, how little concern there seemed to be about data protection. As if, you know, we, we don't really have to concern ourselves about that. If there's going to be a leak, there will be uh, a leak. And I remember sitting on a panel next to the 
pleasant the OECD in charge of all of this, who seemed to accept that there were going to be leaks. A couple of months ago, I was at a conference where somebody, perhaps more Machiavellian than me, you could think of somebody more Machiavellian than me, um, there said, actually, um, it's not that the OECD and other gov and governments are unconcerned about the leaks, they actually want this data leaked. Because leaks of CRS data are going to be the most massive disclosure of wealth held outside of countries, and they would actually quite like that to be leaked um, there, which puts a very interesting perspective on um, who is really driving the agenda. Thank you very much. Virtually all countries, all continents are represented in this room, so let's take advantage of that. Ricardo, please. Thank you. Uh, well, incredible presentation and incredible comments. I, I just want to, to make a reflection considering the, uh, yeah, Professor Roxanne and, and Martin's comments regarding the, the, the quality and, and how do we, understand taxes in the current world in, in with respect of uh, currently the OECD is working in, 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 in all this stuff and CRS from, is, is trying to develop and trying to, 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 to have more information in order to, to, to control these leaks that we are currently having do, uh, within our tax systems uh, and my, 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 my concern is don't you think that this kind of leaks that we are handling are also one of these, uh, one of other improvements that our tax systems have? Because you have FATCA, you have CRS, you have, uh, and well, all the BEPS project, and uh, we are trying to like put patches in our tax system worldwide, considering that we are having all these a tax avoidance, and because we are not, we are considering the, the tax system in a cost-benefit uh, side, and only uh, a revenue stuff regarding governments, and we are not considering the equality and the 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 the, 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 the horizontal equality equity that, that the tax system uh, could have. But uh, don't you think that this kind of leaks uh, also benefit the, the, the tax system uh, as a whole? that could be an, a, an advantage to have this the, 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 the journalist in our side. Any other question, comments? I, I would like to, to make the following point, if I may. I would like to, to offer a, a, look, a, a big picture approach, a big picture approach, which is the context in which we are. I, I think that the fundamental problem we are dealing with is a, an increasing tension between globalization and democracy. So globalization has produced wonderful things, wonderful new technologies, for example. But at the same time, an increasing number, or substantial number of, of people are feeling unhappy. They are, the, the level of inequality, as Partho suggested in his presentation, uh, is increasing dramatically all over the world. So my, my feeling is that the fundamental problem that humanity is currently facing is and the problem of increasing level of inequality. And that, according to the Latin American experience, inequality normally brings political instability, as shown in many countries in, in Latin America. Another contextual element, which is, I think, important to, to, to bear in mind, is the, the emerging fourth industrial revolution that will probably make uh, leaks increasingly frequent. And, I mean, powerful people in the world may use it strategically. What I can see in, in Latin America as well is that um, these leaks many times have been used by, by the government in order to destroy um, candidates from the opposition. So the timing of the leak uh, is normally a critical element, just one day before the election. So I would suggest using a strict scrutiny, particularly on the timing of the leak. But in general, I think leaks, uh, the net effect uh, sh should be, in principle, um, good for, for, for the tax system. Regarding uh, Philip's point, I mean, the tension between transparency and privacy, which is also a very important paper in Diane's um, presentation, um, I tend to think that this is not 
new, a new problem. This is a quite frequent problem. So I would suggest uh, using, I mean, the case law produced um, uh, in connection with the uh, International Convention of Human Rights in, in the Americas and the European Convention of Human Rights in order to see the extent to which that case law could offer a potential solution to that, to that tension between transparency and privacy. My, yes, my final point is that, is the following. I think that the net impact of leaks could be to make taxes system increasingly complex. Because in the context of, of leaks, my feeling is that politicians have the incentive to, to introduce SAR rather than GAR yeah. in order to show local voters that they are doing something to address that. So my prediction would be that um, uh, that taxation will probably become increasingly, increasingly complex because local politicians will have an incentive to, to introduce uh, an increasing number of, of SAR rather than GAR, and that normally, the net effect of that is increasing complexity of the of, of tax systems. That's my final point. And now, um, Bayan, please, you have uh, 10 minutes to, to offer your responses to all these comments. Between 10 and 15. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Do you want me to come here? Do you want me to Whenever you want. Whatever you here. want. This is fine. Um, so, um, just so much. I'm not even sure, honestly, where to begin, except I need a few minutes. So I'll try to do that. Um, and it's just, it's so interesting, and I'm sure you've all had that experience, when you present something in a different audience, the mindset, the frame is completely different. And some parts, they're totally on board with you. don't have to argue. And then other things they really sort of raise and dive into. Um, and also timing matters. But when we were writing this, People thought we were crazy. Like, that even to suggest there's anything to look at, that, that there be any suggestion of caution, not, not using them, but there, there, there's any question at all. We got a lot of pushback. And that actually was part of our framing. Okay, all right, uh, yes, we believe you do this all rationally, et cetera, but here are some ways in which it might, you know, yes, it's free, basically, basically the pitch was we always got, it's free information. There could never be a problem with free information. And, uh, and so, in, in a sense, that sort of drove our, a bit of our thinking as we tried to sort of at least be persuasive. We thought there was something worth government's attention on a sustained basis as you approach using this kind of information. Uh, so it's just fascinating to sort of really hear conversation much more about um, the social and the political backdrop. And it's just been really, it's refreshing and quite valuable. So I, that just is a fact, and, and, and just surprisingly different. I mean, you'd feel like it was a different paper if you sat in some of the other rooms in which we've done it. Uh, but I said, I'm sure you've all had that. Uh, and I do think that the, so first talk you a little bit about uh, both the, the um, context of social upheaval, the issues of distribution. I really do think that's right. It really does, I think, subtly get at you know, what um, is a bit of the driving momentum that does give uh, sort of both the actors as well as I think the public itself, uh, you know, sort of uh, a real grip on it. Why, why does it resonate with people? I think that's really right. And it also, I think, is an interesting sort of way in which you can understand how uh, the motivations of the intermediaries is perhaps not always the same as a tax authority. A tax authority on balance has a more limited scope. It's not that they are against equality. It's not that they're against redistribution inherently or uh, whatever might be some of the broader concerns, but the intermediaries are looking at, I think, a much bigger vision of what they see as wrong with modern society across the globe. Mm -hmm. And that's really sort of informing it. And, and so they're just sort of operating on a slightly different plane uh, with a slightly different mission. And I think that's a really great way of seeing it. Um, and the political dimension. Oh, I mean, there's just, I, I want to write five more papers now. <laughs> like, like, there's nothing, I can't put more in this, no one would read it. Um, but there's so much to be said, and I'm not even sure, in some sense, um, where to begin. I do think, I mean, so one question you asked, which I thought was really fair, and kind of relates to where you, uh, you were headed with some of your comments, is sort of, well, where would we come out right, on this? And so I, I, I sort of say it's both inevitable, but not in the way that, so not to put me in the camp of those who think leaks are inevitable, therefore we shouldn't be concerned about privacy, but rather I do think it's something we're going to see. And so really the question is, if it exists, what do you think governments are going to do? Once that is there and in the public domain, right, what do you think governments are going to do? So I do think there's a bit of inevitability. Um, 
but I think what I, that I see more what I'm trying to do is because there is, and there is actually a, a huge amount of benefit. And I don't think it came out perhaps in as much as what we were t I was talking about, but um, the common commentators all referenced it in different ways. There are a lot of advantages, and, and some really specific ones you can actually point to, not just sort of generic, but because the leaked data comes out, uh, it really, uh, you know, there's a, you know, um, just even in a minor way, you can sort of see the movement of data when it goes from um, with HSBC from France, and then the point was made it's being shared with the different governments. It wasn't, either it wasn't all shared, so that was the problem with India sort of not getting as much information until it actually is public, uh, or it gets shared but then not used. So the Lagarde list, as it was called, the data that went to Greece on uh, HSBC related accounts that, that uh, was shared there and then wasn't used. And then it finally became clear this information had been given, so then the list resurfaces to now be used, and then it has some names missing. Strategic names, I gather, in the government. So, and then that pressure that revolves. I mean, so there's a real way in which it's the publicity that, that really kind of um, pushes either on the frailties of the system, so I'm not, you know, as to why France didn't give everything to India that maybe it should have, or government's willingness to use the information, right? So I think there's a huge amount of value there. Um, uh, but in, but from our perspective, I think what we were trying to do, and it kind of, again, comes out of how we saw the risk, but weren't getting a lot of agreement that there was any, was to sort of give a language and give a, a way of talking about what you actually call the pause button. And I think that's exactly right. You're in, and I think it's, it's really fair to talk about, it's much more of an ongoing, bigger political conversation all the time. There's no way, I mean, no one thinks exactly that. I mean, the idea of, yes, I, I would love to imagine sort of purely rational, lovely enforcement <laughs> with wonderful rules, carefully crafted over time. Sadly, no. Um, but, but, to, but from our purpose, sort of to think of this kind of analysis and the identification of concerns as a way to give those who are involved in the enforcement side a, a, a sort of a legitimate space and, and sort of um, justification for certain kinds of more careful analysis. Um, so I thought that was really um, very useful and helpful to be thinking about. Uh, your your um, observations about FACA and speed as opposed to power, that is so interesting. And I think uh, it reflects something that I struggle with, and I'm always interested in how other people deal with this, which is when you know and can see multiple agendas within your government going on at the same time. And I think he's absolutely right. There are some who, who were eager to seize the moment for maximum reach. Absolutely. Um, at the same time, there are some, and I can think of this sort of based on some specific kinds of conversations, who were involved in the process, who would be actually quite concerned that the, the design of the system reached far beyond what they even thought was legitimate, imposed burdens on those for whom they thought it was not appropriate, and if they had understood it, they would have been interested in reining that in. But the process didn't even get to the stage where there was enough opportunity for that to happen. So you have got both happening at the same time. And so I would struggle, I think it's a really, again, challenging question. How do you sort through what's, what are the biggest forces and factors, and how to, how to tell that story and understand it? Um, what else do I just want to? Uh, Ah, so we were talking about um, horizontal equity at the end, and also entrenchment. So um, the horizontal equity and unevenness, um, you know, just sort of those issues really, um, uh, it, it's fascinating. And again, so, so the idea that um, of uh, making leaks, um, well, transparency, privacy, uh, leaks being public, I mean, not leaks being public, but sort of widely distributing information, what that would do for horizontal equity. I can't even begin to imagine that conversation <coughs> in the US. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how, I mean, <laughs> even within Europe where it might be uneven, you bring that to the US and gaskets would be blown left and right. Um, but it's, again, really useful to sort of think about the extremes of options, what, what kinds of things we're looking at um, in terms of doing that. I don't know where transparency and privacy is going to go more globally, but I can I can see in the US that's not on the horizon for, for a while. Um, it's, it's a fascinating question, but I kind of don't see that. Um, and what was the other 
catch up to some stuff. I mean, quite frankly, it was so much fun to do this. <laughs> this is just a blast. It cannot be more fun than to sit and talk and listen to people's comments. When they've actually really been you know, willing to sort of sit and think and give a perspective that's a bit different than where you've been coming from. I just can't tell you how helpful it is. I've loved it. Mm -hmm.